The sign was put up announcing the demolition of the house. Over 400 people have signed a petition to save it. We are deeply concerned about the plan to tear down the building and put in a parking lot. Certainly there must be other alternatives for parking in that area. We all want businesses to thrive in our capital, but there must be other solutions for parking in view of the number of vacant properties and lots available in the city. We are looking forward to discussing ideas to save this precious homestead. We hope you enjoy the PowerPoint presented today by Ellen Richardson. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our ultimate goal is to save Skull Mansion from demolition. <clears throat> what we would like to do today is to provide a glimpse into the history of the home, its occupants and the importance it plays in the history of our capital city of Dover. Um, at this point, I'm gonna share my screen. Put this on the slideshow. All right, here we are. Um, first, we'll start by going through a timeline of ownership. There have been a total of only three prominent prominently three uh, uh, areas of ownership. In 1863 through 1864, the house was built by Manlove Hayes. In 1910, Manlove Hayes passed away. His heirs, the Wilson family, inherit the house. In 1946, the Wilson family sells the home to Dr. Carl and Mrs. Sarah Skull. In 1950, Dr. Skull passes away suddenly. 1973, Mrs. Skull is successful in having the house listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 1982, the house is sold to Kent General Hospital, now known as Bay Health. This is its third owner. Um, a little more than 10 years later, 1994, Bay Health is given an award of excellence by the Friends of Old Dover for the res restoration efforts. And the next 26 years see increased paving of the property and gradual deterioration of the building. So let's start, who was Manlove Hayes? Manlove Hayes was born on a farm just outside of Dover. He was the 10th of 11 children. His father had a total of three wives. As a young man, Manlove traveled the country as a civil engineer working on railroads. He spent the primary amount of his time in Tennessee. In 1840, when he was 23 years old, the country was facing a, a large depression. Um, the railroad projects were being cut back. He saw the writing on the wall, left the railroad industry, returned to Dover and began to build his legacy. Over the next 70 years, he served for 45 of those years as the director of the Delaware Railroad. He was the chief organizer of the first national bank in Dover and served on the first board of directors. He was one of the founders of the Dover Library in 1885 and served as the first president mm. of the mm. library. He was part owner of the first steamboat service between Little Creek and Philadelphia, which was critical to the peach industry. You'll see a connection to the peach industry later on in the PowerPoint. Um, he was also a state representative supporting the Whig Party and then later Abraham Lincoln. Now here's a little bit of trivia. He was the great grandson of John Bell. And if you're familiar with Dover, which I think a lot of you are, um, the John Bell House is that little wooden structure located on, on the green in historic Dover. Hmm. Um, creation of Grenwald. In 1862, Manlove Hayes purchased from John C. Pennewill a lot of 12 and one half acres just south of Dover. He wished to be close to the Delaware Railroad. As we know, he was the president of the railroad. Uh, also to his relatives in Dover and to a commercial center. Yet he required the pastoral setting to which he had become accustomed. 
1863, he entered into an agreement with Richard D. Smithers to erect a house of his own design. Richard Smithers was an attorney in town um, and his, his home and offices were located where the Gray Fox is currently located. Just a little bit of trivia there. To complete the setting for his gentleman's house, as he referred to it, he engaged William Saunders, a distinguished landscape gardener from Philadelphia, to lay out the ground plan and to select the variety of trees to be planted on the hill called Norwood. Um, in addition, Manlove Hay's brother, Charles, who had inherited the family farm and still living out there, was instrumental, Charles was instrumental in planting different botanical species in the garden. In the spring of, in the spring of 1864, Hayes moved his family into his completed house and from there he conducted his several business interests. Let's talk about Manlove's family. Manlove and his wife, Rebecca, had four daughters. These daughters inherited the home upon his death in 1910. <clears throat> the first daughter was Mary Hayes. She lived until 1934. She married John Ponder Salisbury, who was the grandson of Governor James Ponder and the son of Senator Chancellor Willard Salisbury. Um, Edith Hayes was the second of his daughters. She died in 1910, the same year as Manlove. Now, Edith married Daniel Mifflin Wilson. The Mifflin family was uh, a leader in the Dover and central Delaware area of the peach industry. So you can see how um, the, the steamboat service to Philadelphia was critical not only to the peach industry, but also to the success of the Wilson family. Um, the Wilson family had three children, Manlove Hayes Wilson, Ralph Carmelt Wilson, and Richard Emerson Wilson. And they lived in the, in the house until her death. She died in 1910, as mentioned earlier. Her husband, Daniel Mifflin Wilson, died only six years after they were married, so he was not he didn't live in the home, but she did. The third child, Laura Hayes, died in 1861 at age four. She never lived in the home. Annabelle Hayes died in 1945. Anna lived in the home until her death. So the two daughters that were still living at the time in 1910 were Mary Hayes, and who was at, by that point a widow, and um, Annabelle Hayes. So those are the two that, that uh, inherited the home. Numerous members of the family lived in the home over the next 36 years, including his daughters, his grandchildren, some great grandchildren, and even some great great grandchildren, one of whom we have on our call today. Um, one great granddaughter-in-law was Sarah Brewster Wilson, who served as the co-founder and president of the junior board at Kent General. So automatically, we have a connection there between the hospital and the property. Manlove had originally named the estate Norwood. It was built on Norwood Hill, so that would make sense. Later, his daughters, Mary and Annabelle, changed the name to Grenwald, spelled G-R-E-N-E-W-A-L-D, and it is pronounced Grenwald. When Sarah Skull submitted the application to the National Historic Register, she spelled the name Greenwald with the secondary name of the Man Love Hayes house. But it, within the family, it has always been referred to as Grenwald. Annabelle Hayes, here is a, a portrait of Annabelle, one of the few pictures we, we have of her, thanks to the Wilson family who forwarded that to us. Annabelle, uh, she was the last surviving daughter of Rebecca and Manlove. She passed away in 1945 while still living in the home. Now, Manlove's mother was a Quaker, and as a result, Manlove, his wife, his mother, 
and two of his children, Laura, the four-year-old, and Edith, Edith Wilson, are buried in the Friends Meeting House Cemetery in Little Creek. Manlove had his father's grave along with the graves of his father's first two wives, both of whom passed away before he uh, married Manlove's mother, along with the graves of his father's first two wives, reinterred from the family farm to Christ Episcopal Church Cemetery in May of 1873. So this was about nine or 10 years after he had moved into Granwald. Almost all of the descendants of this family are buried either in the Friends Meeting House Cemetery in Little Creek or in the churchyard of Christ Episcopal Church in Dover. And you're welcome to, there is a cemetery tour over at Christ Church that you can take and you can see where the, the graves are. Transition of ownership. After her death in 1945, Annabelle's nephews, these were Edith, Wil Edith uh, Hayes Wilson's sons, Manlove Hayes Wilson, Ralph Carmel Wilson and Richard Emerson Wilson. They, they were all executors and they sold Grenwald to Dr. Carl and Sarah Skull in 1946. Sadly, Dr. Skull passed away suddenly just four years later in 1950. But we'll talk about Carl Brown Skull. Here he is, he is in the back gardens. This is, we, we believe the picture was taken about 1946. You'll notice the trellis here in the back garden of Grenwald. Carl Brown Skull was a local man. He was born in Wyoming, Delaware in 1902. He attended the University of Pennsylvania for both his bachelor's and his medical degree. While interning at Allegheny General Hospital out near Pittsburgh, he met his future wife, Sarah Karstetter. Sarah had graduated with, I think it was a degree in chemistry. She worked in the lab at the hospital. They returned to Dover in 1929 and opened his medical practice. He served as the chief of staff at Kent General Hospital and the president of Kent County Medical Society during the 1930s. So again, we have another connection with the property and the hospital, which is directly across the street. In 1941, Carl Skull was appointed to the medical examiner for the Kent County Draft Board. Between 1942 and 1944, he served as the medical officer in POW camps in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, returning to the States in 1945, working on the staff of a VA hospital in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Dr. Skull resumed his medical practice in Dover, opening a practice at 20 South State Street in 1946. This same year, the family purchased and moved into Greenwald. At the time of his sudden death in 1950, Carl Skull was the president of the Medical Society of Delaware. So let's look at some pictures throughout the years. This is a painting. Um, it, it was a commissioned painting of Granwald. We believe it was done in 1946. These are the gardens and the trellis you can see here in 1920, during the time when the Wilson family owned it. Here are the great grandchildren known as the smiling Wilson kids in the yard of Granwald. Here they are, these are the great grandchildren, man love Hayes Wilson Jr. Henry, also known as Harry Wilson, and Edith Hayes Wilson. They are sitting on a bench underneath the trellis. Here they are. This is a, a picture further back. Here's the trellis that you can see along with the gardens and the great grandchildren beneath the trellis. Let's fast forward to 1952 and the garden trellis again at Granwald is hosting the wedding reception of Becky Skull, daughter of Carl and Sarah, and Alden Bradford Richardson III. 
Here's a picture of Becky leaving the front of Granwald on her way to the church to get married. Here she is at the back. They held the reception in the gardens and she threw her wedding bouquet from the balcony on the back of the house. Here she is, a picture of her in 1948, four years earlier, coming down the grand staircase within, uh, yeah. within the, host, the building. A picture of Sarah's skull in the parlor in 1946. You can see the, the beautiful wallpaper. Word. Here is Becky. Just drop the call all together. Just leave, period. Done. Here is Becky in, in the Northwest room. You can see again, wallpaper. This is a picture of the marble mantle in the Northwest room, which is still there today. You can see a portion of it here, but when the hospital purchased, they, they did remove all the wallpaper from the walls. It's a picture of a sideboard in the dining room. Southeast doors. This is Southeast. This is opposite from the Northwest room. And it's leading to the veranda. Now, an interesting thing about these doors, these walls here are 12 inches thick. We believe they're brick covered with cement and then on the outside covered with stucco. This actually, it, it appears to be a window. The bottom half, these two little doors do open out to the veranda, um, but this upper part is operates as a window and it actually goes up into a hollow space above the, the top threshold there. So I thought that was interesting. Mm. And there are two, two doors like that within the Southeast leading to the veranda. In 1973, Sarah Skull, well in 72, Sarah Skull submitted an application to the National Registry of Historic Buildings. In 1973, it was accepted. These are pictures taken at that time that are a, a part of the National Registry showing what the house looked like as it appeared in 1973. Um, behind the house was a carriage house. It had been converted to an apartment and rented to the same family for many years. This is the front of the house. You can see it is, it's quite overgrown with its landscaping. Here is the carriage drive leading back to the carriage house. Here is a picture of the back balcony in 1973, 21 years after Becky and Alton were married. This is the balcony where she stood when she threw her wedding bouquet. Third change of ownership. 1982. This is an article from the Delaware State News dated February 22nd, 1982, announcing the sale of Skull Mansion to Kent General Hospital. Um, over the course of the year, the hospital performed an extensive facelift of the property, both inside and out. You can see what it looked like when they purchased the house. And this is, is the home one year later, which the landscaping has been cleaned up quite a bit. They installed an alarm system. The electrical service increased the amperage. Several additional outlets were added. Several additional bathrooms were added on both the first and the second floor. The water heater was replaced. A water cooler installed. That's a water fountain, basically. Um, moldings and plaster work throughout the building were repaired. It's important to note that no zoning changes were necessary for the property to become um, part of the, of the hospital. And the, and the hospital truly embraced the home. In 1983, James Raber, an assistant administrator for the hospital, told Delmarva Crossroads that because the house is sound, we can use it for hospital office space. A budget of $20,000 was allocated for improvements. In 2020's currency, this would equate to about $52,200. Uh, the hospital's accounting office was moved into the second floor in early January, 1983, less than a year after they had purchased the home. The third floor, the plan for the third floor was storage of files. 
The first floor was being renovated for the offices and waiting room of Dr. Alan Kramer, the psychiatrist who directed the hospital's mental health clinic. Also on the first floor were plans for a 29 by 15 foot conference room. We believe that that probably was the original dining room space since that was a large room. Um, we gained 2,500 usable square feet of space. We feel it is a cost-effective use of the house, said Raber. So that's interesting to know that at the time, um, the hospital was quite enthusiastic about it. These are pictures you can see. This doorway here is this doorway. And whoops, sorry about that. Here is the, um, the water cooler. This is the window that we, we saw earlier that, that scoots way up into the, uh, an empty space above the lintel. Um, the original height of the ceilings was retained. The hospital did in, you know, install modern lighting in that room. One little bit of trivia is the hospital groundskeeper at the time when, when Kent General purchased the home was a former employee of Longwood Gardens. And I think most of you are familiar with Longwood Gardens and how beautiful they are. After the grounds were cleaned up, he was subsequently married under the arbor that we saw in previous slides at the rear of the house. That's interesting trivia, I thought. Here we are, 1994, 10 years later, the home was celebrated with pride. The friends of Old Dover recognized the restoration and maintenance efforts of Kent General with its annual award of excellence at its annual meeting in May of 1994. Here is a picture from the Dover Post dated Wednesday, May 25th, 1994. And here is a color photo of the home. You can see how beautiful the grounds are and what wonderful stewards the hospital had been um, in, in keep maintaining the beauty of the home. Uh, this picture we believe was taken in 2006. It shows that the carriage house was still standing and several large trees had not yet been removed and the driveway was still unpaved. There is a presence of air conditioners in the windows, um, although that might just be routine climate control for the empty structure. We don't know whether it was occupied at that time. Let's talk about architectural details. If you drive around Dover, you can see a, a wonderful large and varied collection of architectural styles, including, but not limited to, cottage Gothic, Italianate, Federalist, Colonial Revival, Georgian, Victorian, and Tudor style. This home is of, uh, of the Italianate style. It's a subset of Victorian. Here is a description from the original document on the National Registry. The exterior of the house is faced in stucco. The west facade, which is what faces State Street, is composed of five bays and it features an elaborate cross gable with a triple lancet window, one, two, three. All the second story windows have elaborately detailed lintels. The cornice of the house is bracketed. Across the front stretches a veranda, which connects the carriage, North Carriage Drive and the South Porch. Um, further, indicate, further research indicates that the walls are made of 15 inch thick concrete. So I think I did mention that earlier. The original details of the home were retained. Now, many houses of, of this period, remember he built the in eight, over the period of 1863 to 1864, many houses were, were modifications on those widely distributed in pattern books. Drawings on the right are from Sloan's Victorian Buildings, published in 1852, 
and then reprinted again in American Houses in 2004. You can see that Skull, Skull Mansion does have the large veranda porch. Um, it, it is the suburban form. In the, the home American Houses, it shows that rounded windows were popular at that time. And we do have those appearing on, on Skull Mansion. Hood ornaments were popular. Detailed lintels, you can see them here. And they were also on the windows of the lower level as well. And then just brackets galore. And this is, this is a reprint from the 1852 book of a bracket, but you can see them clearly uh, in, in plenty on the building. Now, sadly, the landscape portion of the property was not protected. Um, the, when the property was originally submitted and approved for the National Historic Registry, the areas of significance were both the architecture and the landscape architecture. Remember, he had a, a prominent landscaper, William Saunders, come down from Philadelphia to help him design the yard. That was equally important to him, as was the structure. These are pictures currently. This is the front of the house that faces State Street. And you can see the, the large uh, lollipop trees, I like to call them, are gone. The house, it's, it's paved completely right up to the front front porch there. Here is the side. This is the, the um, balcony where Becky threw her wedding bouquet from. This, the, the side porch mm -hmm. is, has been uh, long gone. I think that that was in very bad condition even when the hospital purchased the building. Um, here, this picture is taken from the view of where the carriage house used to be. It is no longer there. It's been paved. Um, here is the south or yeah, the, the North Carriage Drive it still remains, but it leads to nowhere. And then here is a picture uh, directly of the back of the house from the parking lot. So un unfortunately, the property was not protected um, and has slowly uh, slipped away. The heritage of Dover and its residents is slowly slipping away Demolishing this historic building erases not only the physical presence of a beautiful structure, but also the legacy of the occupants who gave so much to both the city and the hospital. How many people have ever even heard of Man Love Hayes before today? Um, how can you help prevent this from happening? Contact your city councilman. Ask the council to adopt automatic protection for properties listed on the National Register. We're looking for something similar to what Newcastle County has. Um, Kent County has not uh, adopted those. Write letters of appeal to the hospital. Join with your neighbors to generate additional support. Write letters to the editor of every local newspaper. Engage your local and state government representatives and spread the word through social media. We'd like to thank you for your support um, and invite you to become a member of the Historical Society of Dover, which is also known as the Friends of Old Dover. And here is our contact information. And thank you for, for joining and viewing this PowerPoint today. At this point, um, I'll open the, the floor for any questions that, that you might have about what you've seen in this PowerPoint. And then afterwards, Nate Attard uh, will give a few words about what we're doing with, you know, some of the events that are happening with the hospital and, and progress so far on trying to save the building from demolition. So, I will stop sharing and ask if anyone has questions. Yeah. Ellen, that was a hell of a presentation. Well, thank you. Yeah, and yeah. 
And and thank you, Dan, also for your contribution to to so many of the pictures that were in the in the PowerPoint. Hi, this is Kip. Hi, Kip. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Thank you so much for that presentation. You're welcome. I was in that house when Sarah and Louise lived in it. I taught school with Louise, and also Sarah was at that school, but. They both referred to the house as Hayes Hill. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, good. I wasn't in the history and I didn't know if, if you were aware of that. Well, and Sarah I used to get out on the roof to grab the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Pushkin, Pushkin, I, I believe. I don't know, I don't remember the name. I, I remember seeing her launch herself through a window on the second story and then relaunch yourself back through the window, sitting on the sill and then coming in backwards. Oh my God. It was God. pretty spry. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Did, did you say that there, there will be, is, is anybody from the hospital on and will they talk to us today? Hey, uh, this is Nate Attard. It looks like uh, Daniel Pro Hudson from the hospital is on. Um, I don't know if anyone else is on. I don't know if they were planning to speak. trust for the historic pre presentation. I used to be a member there years and years and years ago. And that's why I, I wonder. All right, if, if there are no questions about the PowerPoint, and thank you, Kip, for adding that about Hayes Hill. I had heard it referred to informally as Hayes Hill, but I've never seen anything in writing um, referred to it, but, but you know, rightfully so. It is, it was the Hayes, it was in the Hayes family for decades. So. Hi, um, are you taking open comments now? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Karen Horton and uh, my family goes to church at Holy Cross and born and raised in Dover and I think right now what I'm interested in is where is the application at in the process. Also, I remember when um, Kent General was doing all these upgrades and my understanding, because I remember the Dover Post used to be much more elaborate in their stories, but how they talked about in one development proposal about, yeah, they're tearing down, there was like a prior proposal where they tore down something, but it was very well noted that they were, hey, we were preserving this building skull and then the one that's right there next to the building. I think it's very important about how we shape this narrative moving forward um, about what the past the hospital's commitment has been, you know, the things that they have been doing um, because it was really presented in a, you know, that the hospital was really preserving and had embraced this. So everybody kind of let their guard down that such a thing would ever happen, you know, and also I think it's important moving forward in this narrative that we talk about the, not only the contribution of the Skull Mansion to the entryway into one of the most beautiful historic areas in the country coming from the south. I mean, I think these points are all very important to include in public discussions moving forward. Um, and I do believe it's very important that uh, we use our social media and engaging the public and not, I mean, the history is very important, but I think people don't realize like <laughs> what's going to replace that moving forward and how that's gonna really alter Dover's very unique landscape moving forward. Um, also, like there are so many other areas around the hospital which are underutilized, you know, that we can perhaps start pointing to them to say, why doesn't the city of Dover and the hospital work together to pursue those areas instead? Those are the things that I think are really critical moving forward in this discussion. Mary, would you like to give, or, or Nate, give an update on where we are in discussions with the hospital? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll we'll advance to the next item on the agenda here. So, Ellen, I first of all want to just thank you. That is like a, one of the best like uh, pre <clears throat> excuse me preservation presentations I've seen from someone I know who's just an amateur preservationist. So okay. that, that research was expert. So for everyone in their the Richardson Skull family, and for those of you guys in the um, the Wilson family as well, thank you for contributing all that wonderful content. We. Uh, we have a national register listing for this house in 1973 that just has very, very little detail it, to it compared to what you produce today. So I really hope that in addition to saving this house, we can look to update that with some of this wonderful information that uh, I think will unfortunately disappear if we don't, we don't document it moving forward. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nate Attard. Um, I am a professional planner here in Dover. I moved to Dover Two years ago, I, I, I work as a transportation planner outside of this, but I'm a, I have a preservation background and really enjoy sort of doing this on the advocacy side. Um, and I really just want to thank everyone who signed the petition that I put forward in October of 2020 on the, the Skull Mansion. Um, I didn't know a lot about it. Frankly, I knew far, far less than clearly Ellen does. Uh, I just had the register listing and it. it really, frankly, outraged me that we would consider tearing down a building listed on the National Register, especially one that um, had so much, uh, so much affinity in the community. Uh, and I found that out when I put that petition out there. Frankly, I thought maybe 10 or 15 people would sign and we could take it to the Planning Commission and say, hey, at least I have 15 people. And then more than 400 people signed, I think, which is amazing and really shows the position that this house holds in our community. Uh, it's something very important to so many people. Um, and just watching all of the, the memories in that slideshow, it's almost like something that uh, preservationists around the country who work in this on a more professional basis, I think wish we had across more communities. So uh, let me just say today, I'm really proud of you as citizens of Dover who put that together. Uh, I just wanna to say too, I'm really grateful to friend, for the friends of all Dover who really picked up the mantle on this effort. Um, I couldn't have done it alone and myself speaking on uh, preservation issues. Uh, by myself isn't worth very much, but with a group like you guys behind us, um, it's, it's extremely important. Um, and really, I just want to recognize that this kind of effort is the type of effort that the Friends of Old Dover has taken throughout its history, right? It, it, founded as a, it was founded as a group that, that did this thing often, right? Like advocate against efforts that were going to uh, change how Dover looked and felt. And I, I am really proud today that this group has um, taken this on as an issue, um, because I think it it could potentially redefine our community, as Karen was uh, mentioning in her comment. Uh, so the thing I'm most proud about with the petition is that the petition did effectively um, pull the application, the master plan application, from in front of the planning commission uh, as it was supposed to be heard in October of 2020. Uh, so right now, um, we're basically in a, uh, an unclear place where this is in terms of application. Uh, so the hospital was going to take this master plan application in front of the planning commission. Uh, in, the, in regards to this property, there's no protections available through our historic district commission. Our historic district in Dover actually ends two parcels to the north, uh, which is an unfortunate oversight um, as to how um, our uh, historic district is structured. So it really was in front of the planning commission on a, a land use application uh, the important thing to note, um, and that was, I think, dug up by one of the planners of the city of Dover, uh, who is responsible for historic preservation, is that the Planning Commission does actually have a, a small role in historic preservation. Uh, so they're charged to, um, in uh, the uh, code of the city of Dover, they're charged to basically uh, consider properties on the National Register when approving master plan applications. So it does actually sit within um, the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to reject this application because of the risk uh, that is being posed to the National Register property of the Skull Mansion. Um, and I, I believe that is what has um, led the hospital to an extent reconsider uh, its initial application. Um, whereas if this had been uh, something that had no um, really legal grounds for the Preservation Commission to say no, um, and they just did it out of emotional love for the building, um, it would have, uh, in fact, probably moved forward at this point. But we're, we're lucky that this sort of uh, gave us some time uh, as a group to try to, uh, I think, move the hospital in a, a different direction um, and really come up with plans of our own on how to advocate for this structure. 
Uh, so in, uh, in credit to the uh, to Mary Mason, the president, um, and Ann Baker Horsey, uh, we met with the uh, representatives of Bay Health, um, including the vice president for development in December of 2020. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to uh, hear their perspective um, and provide some input as to, to what we thought potentially could be done with the house. Um, I, we, the first meeting largely went, um, uh, it was a frankly very, um, very good meeting in terms of a positive, positive reception to what we were saying, um, but not a lot of sort of change in position or anything uh, from the hospital at this point. Uh, so we've largely advanced, uh, I think, as a group to uh, trying to figure out what what more can we uh, say and what more can we bring to the table to try to uh, get the decision on this changed. And I think with that, um, I, uh, I think we're going to open it at this point uh, to uh, a broader panel discussion for further comments from people who were at the meeting. Uh, so I was there, um, and I'm happy to, to chime in as to things. Uh, Mary Mason was there, Ann Baker Horsey was there, uh, Karen Speakman was there, and Helen uh, Egbet was there as well. <laughs> Sorry. That's I'm... all right. <laughs> okay. I would, um, Nate? Yeah. Um, I would like to add something. Thank you very much, and thank you also, Ellen, for your remarks. I have uh, been contacted by the hospital. I was contacted last night. I'm not sure if they knew we were having the meeting or not, uh, but I decided not to get back to them until after our meeting. And they want to meet with us again. Um, I think they want to, uh, I, I don't know exactly what, if they want to uh, placate us or if they just want to do more discussions and see if there is something that we can do just to solve this problem. I did receive, we asked them for several things. We wanted to have access to the building. We wanted to get an engineer to go in there and, and look to see, you know, what sort of things needed to be taken care of um, for, for renovations or saving the building. And also ideas of maybe uh, moving the building. And he did uh, give me an estimate for renovating the building. And it was a pretty high amount of money that would just be, it was $2 million. I mean, it's just so out of the ballpark. But he also gave us information who to get in touch with to move the building. So there are two things that we're thinking, what is the possibility that we will be able to raise the money to renovate it and to, to turn it into a viable building or move the building. So that's just sort of where we stand right now. We will be meeting them again the first week in February and we'll get back to you as to what the next steps would be from there. So I'll add something to what was said already. Um, when we met with the, the hospital, they, um, did discuss all the plans that they had for parkings. This is really a this the reason that they want to tear down this building is for parking. Um, that they need it for their employees and for visitors. Very clearly, and we don't dispute. I don't think the need for their parking, and they do own this property. Um, they I missed some of what Karen's comments where I had to run and open the door at the office here, but. Um, we did certainly share that this was certainly the south entrance to Dover. We share that they should look at alternatives. They discussed the issues with the parking that is directly to the north of the hospital. As you may all know, that is a very large or an area that's prone to flooding. And they said it really, they're not, they, they originally, I guess we're talking about maybe building a, a garage on that property, but because a city has not addressed the drainage issue, and I guess that's, a, that's something we need to find a little bit more about, has not explored or not, it's probably very expensive to, to solve that drainage issue. Coming, um, there is a creek that is buried, you know, if you know between um, Elm Terrace and then this property, there's a definitely a dip in the, in the landscape. That is where there's a, actually a stream that is buried and that goes down along parallel to Water Street. And that's why there's so many storm drain issues in the area. So that is something that the 
So they're sort of saying we can't solve that right now and we, we need this parking right now. So we're gonna do this. I mean, they're tearing down not only Skull Mansion but a number of other properties on that. I just wonder about the cost of all that doing the, that work. However, um, I think what else was said at that meeting. I mean, they seem to be, well, tell us what your ideas are. I mean, I don't, I didn't get a sense that they would be willing to take on hardly any expense, but we could certainly approach that with them if we, and as a group, raise money and decide to move the profit, move the building or something like that. I, I don't, uh, you know, unless we can convince them to build parking elsewhere, I, I think they just, I, I didn't get a sense that they, they kept saying how much it would cost to restore this building. They can't use it as a commercial building. We understand that. And this is a historic building, it needs to be reserved as a historic building. So, anybody else wants to add to that? So. Um, Karen, this is Karen again. Mm -hmm. I, uh, hold on just a minute, let me, here I am. <laughs> um, I just woke up and just kind of brought out of bed to hurry up and get in the Zoom call. Um, the things that I had brought up and I'm glad that those were raised were how it's gonna impact, you know, the entryway into Dover, you know, that it is one of the most significant um, historical areas and it always is such a gorgeous way to enter Dover. And I know in some areas, you know, whenever they have these type of problems, that, for example, um, I don't understand why they're not looking to underutilized areas in uh, Governor's Avenue, you know, just one street over. Why are they looking at this area? And I really do want to stress that when this first happened back in the mid 90s, that it was all over the Dover Post and it was really presented as a kind of like, yeah, we're going to make these ex expansions and changes, but look what we're doing for these remaining buildings. We're really gonna lovingly take care of Skull Mansion. We're also going to lovingly take care of that building that's closer to the hospital. I remember they made a very big deal about how they got that building renovated. They detailed it in the Dover Post about how they got the well. There was a well and how now it's now a working well. You know, and so it was really presented as an exchange and their proposal, whatever that proposal was at the time, and I'd be very interested in seeing the minutes and everything, but I know when it got presented in the Dover Post, it was very much like an exchange of, we're going to do this, but instead, in exchange, we're taking care of these buildings, these two buildings, Skull and the one right next to the hospital, and I really see it as Bay Health abandoning their commitment yeah. to these buildings. Mm -hmm. And and that um, I remember uh, going into Skull Mansion a few times and seeing how gorgeous. That is one of the most beautiful buildings. When I was younger, I remember trying to make a miniature uh, dollhouse based mm -hmm. on the architectural features mm -hmm that Donna outlined in, outlined in her presentation. It truly is magnificent. And while I see moving, you know, I don't understand why it should be moved when Bay Health made this commitment to taking care of it and maintaining it. I think one of the uh, things that we need to really stress with them is their prior commitments um, to the buildings, um, and I do agree that we need to do immediate fundraising, hopefully, you know, that we can do something to save this building because I just feel like Dover is so special and um, we just really need to save these pieces that make it special. Mm -hmm. so I'll, oh, I'm sorry. So somebody else had a question about um, it has a national trust for historic preservation been contacted. That's what that is. Hey, this is Nate Attard. Um, yeah, we are planning on contacting them. So uh, right now is open nomination time for the um, the 11 most endangered historic places in the U.S. Um, and the principal Dover has agreed to support an application that I will put in. That's what this is. 
Um, and the National Trust, though, is largely an advocacy organization. Um, they do own some historic sites around the U.S., but it's primarily things that they've inherited. Um, they, they primarily just help with technical assistance. So uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of funding there available to us. Um, then there's not a lot of it, there's not a lot that they can do. Um, really, the, the onus on preservation is local. Could I chime in here for a second? Um, yes. because this is Michael at the University of Delaware. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I do think one of your best things is to, and I think you've done a great job. I live in Northern Delaware, but I certainly picked up on the Skull Mansion controversy uh, several months ago. So you guys are out there on social media raising awareness and that's, that's a great first step. I think um, ratcheting up the press on this as much as possible and creating political pressure on the hospital is, is um, a really important thing to do a little bit more uh, bargaining leverage as far as um, them wanting for PR reasons, right, to not seem anti-community, anti-Dover history, um, which the previous or two speakers ago was talking about this previous com uh, commitment, which is now being uh, forsaken. That's, that's a really common theme in preservation. Um, developers all the time promise to take care of something if they can subdivide it and build, and then, you know, seven, eight years later, they knock, they knock the building down anyway. So, I think if you can raise awareness through uh, press, I would certainly contact Preservation Delaware. Um, well, I'm, I'm on the board of Preservation Delaware, but get, try to get Preservation Delaware involved. Um, Nature 8 right now is the open call period for the National Trust's famous list of 13 endangered properties they release every year across the country. Frankly, it's a hard sell right now for um, uh, at a time when they're trying to really diversify preservation and recognize lots of different um, you know, preservation types of buildings for underrepresented groups, African-American history, Native American history, LGBTQ. Um, it could be hard to get kind of just another Victorian mansion on, on a national list like that. But Preservation Delaware is in just talks as we speak. Uh, there's an email chain about creating a similar list for Delaware specific. So this would be something you'd wanna get on the state of Delaware endangered list if we do publish something like that soon. Um, and, and like I said, that's, that's certainly in the works. But in historic preservation, the, the, the most important thing, as people say, is to find old buildings, new jobs. And I think one of the most critical things you could do is, is to continue to try to keep a good working relationship with the hospital and help them see the light. It sounds like they're, they're being pretty limited on what they say they can use that building for. Um, and I'm sure there are real zoning and code problems and stuff for various uses of that. But offices tends to be something, I don't know if that's still a viable possibility for the hospital and, and, and for meeting rooms that kind of thing, event space. So if they can be made to see at all that this could be an asset in any way, um, I'm sure people have already thought of that and tried that. Um, that. That's one of the most critical things is that you're not just trying to preserve an amber, some old piece of the past that's not really useful except for someone goes through every couple of weeks to tour it, um, but, but that it's really still a useful building worth investing in. And so any kind of discussions to continue to, to make them see those possibilities uh, would be huge. Um, so I think that's my main thing. You know, protections are tough. Even Newcastle County only has the ability to put nine month holds on properties that are being uh, proposed for demolition. So even if something's on the National Register, they can only say, wait, we're going to put, we're going to stop the clock on this for nine months and hope you reconsider. But after nine months and one day, boom, it gets knocked down. So, uh, and that takes a long time. Um, so it's unfortunate, uh, Nate said this is just outside the, the, the local district there, but I'm, I'm glad to hear a comprehensive um, plan process maybe. Is that section 106, Nate, that allows you to possibly um, prevent uh, approving a plan like that? Or is that a separate thing? No, it's uh, it's written specific into the city of Dover's code. So section 106 doesn't apply at all, which is a, a requirement for demolition to be reconsidered if it uses federal funds. The hospital is not using any sort of federal funds here. Um, no, it's it's specific to the city of Dover zoning code. Well, that, that's great. Why it was added and how it was added, I'm not really sure, but it, it's frankly good that it's there. All right. Yeah. So I mean. It's pretty small stuff, but there are um, tax credits available for properties that are on the National Register or, or, or deemed eligible for the National Register. Um, the National Park Service has a, a tax credit program from the federal level uh, for income producing properties. Delaware also has a tax credit prob, um, program that um, for even non-income producing properties, even just people who own a historic house can apply for tax credits for repair work that's 
carried out to the Secretary of Interior standards. So in other words, you gotta, it has to, the work has to be um, in keeping with the historical look of the mansion, which of course would be the desired outcome here. And uh, I know they're always trying to, you know, Wilmington's really heavy in using that pool of tax credit money. So they're always looking for more Southern parts of the state to tap into that tax credit money for, for renovations on historic properties in, in Delaware. So that's, that's another source of possible funds that can make a renovate or a re restoration of this building and its preservation more affordable for the hospital or a friends group. Uh, can I say something? It's very small. Yes. Can I say something? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I wanted to say that the hospital has tons and tons of money. They shouldn't be in this position to squeak out a little bit like, oh my gosh, we can't do this. They were negligent. They let the house go. It is, it is their fault that the house is in the, in the condition that it is. They were terrible stewards of that building. And they have a responsibility as a steward of a building, a historical building. They can restore this. They have tons of money. And this is a common playbook for, you know, especially developers, um, the demolition by neglect thing, right? It is you let it sit long enough until it's too expensive to repair. I know. And, and then they exaggerate the cost. I mean, maybe it really is $2 exactly. million dollars to, to exactly. restore this building. But I mean, one, one uh, point of order would be to, uh, to, to get in here and, and get some other opinions on what a reasonable uh, preservation, restoration, <laughs> renovation would cost here. Because um, usually that's an inflated number they use to justify ripping exactly. down um, something that uh, needs to be preserved. But I'll just end saying this, um, you know, Delaware, you know, we, we have a historic preservation program at the University of Delaware. We teach architectural history and preservation courses uh, at the Center for Historic Architecture and Design. And one thing I tell my students often is Delaware is one of the more conservative states in the country for its architecture. It, it didn't tend to have flashy, cutting edge, avant-garde, high style architecture. Dover's an exception. It has some pretty great stuff. Um, Wilmington's exception. There's lots of smaller towns that have some pretty cool architecture. But the Skull Mansion is definitely an architecturally significant building. It's, it's a beautiful yeah. Italian building and um, with a lot of its original uh, elements intact, which uh, we'd say has high integrity is the language we use in the preservation world. And so such a high style building with such high integrity um, that has such obvious um, historical, um, deep historical roots as Ellen's presentation highlighted. This is really a building worth preserving and worth fighting for. And, uh, and, and, and that's another reason I think that you could get even more press and creating more political pressure by getting people even outside of Dover um, <laughs> interested in fighting for this and, and raising awareness. Can I make a comment over here? Yes, go ahead, Joe. I like, I like Michael's comments. At, uh, one of the things that I caught with what he said was, I, I really don't think we need to go in there guns a blazing. You have to do this. You can afford that. You know, don't, don't tear it down. I think we need to have some sort of um, compromising uh, situation with them where we talk to them. It's their property, not ours. Uh, to tell you the truth, I'm conflicted about it. I don't want to see it torn down, but I didn't sign the petition and I won't sign the petition. Uh, the hospital is our number one employer in our town. And we have to always be aware of that. Lots of high price jobs. That doesn't justify tearing it down. But I just want to make sure, how would you feel if someone came to you and said, I don't like what you're doing to your, um, your property and 25 of us are going to meet and talk about what we can do to your property. So, you know, I want to be careful about the way we approach this. Joe, I do agree that we don't want to go in there guns a blazing, but at the same time, you know, when the whole thing, when this, when they went and did their initial expansions, they always presented it as they're going to preserve these buildings. They're going to maintain these buildings. It's simply keeping them to their commitment. I think it really lulled, it lulled me into a sense of, you know, slumber for lack of better word that these were off the chart or off the radar or something we don't need to worry about because the hospital is maintaining them and that when they were going through all of these proposals for expansion here and there it was always like and but we're preserving skull mansion so for this 11th hour that all of a sudden they're coming in I feel like they're the ones coming in guns a blazing you know, with this demolition, 
mm-hmm. that we're just simply saying, hey, hold up, hold up. you know, we, and we just need to have a strong, not guns a-blazing, but a strong, firm, comprehensive approach moving forward. And yes, they do own the building. I understand that. But they also made a lot of proposals and went to the city for a lot of requests, you know, um, for certain things. And the discussion of the Skull Mansion was always kind of like a, a, how do I say, a bargaining chip, you know. So it served them quite well over the years. Now that they've gotten everything that they wanted, you know, they don't need that bargaining chip anymore. So I think that's really important to keep in this conversation. And then what's going to stop them after they get the Skull Mansion? You know, I mean, it's really, I just want to bring that context back to the discussion. And I'll assure, assure you, Joe, that we did not go in with, with the guns blazing. When we met with oh, no, I know that. Okay, just, like, just so you know. It sounds like things are getting a little heated up now, though. You know. Well, I, I mean, think we have to Helene's see all... Friend, Helene's a friend of mine, but she said, oh, my God, they've got, you know, they can just write a check for it. They well, probably could. Th- th- yeah, I think there's all they kinds probably of... probably could. We need to hear all <laughs> sides. That's why this is a town meeting, right? We need to hear all possibilities. Exactly. So, that's all. I agree I have a, with, with I have a Darren. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, here's a curveball. Uh, what if I just bought it? Can you? Yeah. Uh, depending on the price, uh, probably. I don't think it's for sale. Yeah, that's. Everything's for sale. Sure yeah, I, I don't well, think it's for sale. We, we that pitched that as an sale. option to the hospital, right? Like, that would be my number one. Just sell it to someone who wants to own and fix up an old house, right? Like, easiest thing to do, parcel off the significant part of the property that's left and sell it. And they uh, they made a number of uh, claims to us that I we would need to get verified by the city's planning department. Um, but they don't, they just want the land for parking. I, I suggested, why don't we just parcel off the house? And they uh, were unwilling to go the approach, which is, Put it in front of the board of adjustment to create a tiny parcel around the house they instead just said no we can't do that um so they, it doesn't look like that's an option but if frankly if you're there and available to do that um i we need to put that in our, our playbook as well does anybody have an idea of what the property is appraised at or would be appraised at um let me tell you they one of the things we're going to talk about at our meeting in february is They are going to allow us to be in the house to get appraisals, to get anything they want. So they are being very cooperative with us. And in our meetings, we all say we want a win-win situation. We don't want to be antagonistic or ask for too much. So they really are trying to give us the opportunity to get the information that we need. So that's one of the things we will do is get an appraisal. Great. I will say if someone, this is Karen again, I'm sorry. But if someone does want to buy, I, I think if we had several GoFundMe efforts, and I know there's a lot of best practices around the country, and perhaps how we can make them very successful, we maybe could help support you, you know, in if there was a gap in buying the property, you know. Um, right. Hey, guys. Um, this is uh, Eric Cherwinski. Um, how about the possibility, again, again, we're talking about buying the building or the the property. Um, what about the potential of having them transfer it to a 501c3 so the building itself could be moved? I mean, we talked about moving before. Uh, they might just do a $1 transfer of the building right. as long as it goes to a 501c3 with a development uh, plan for that building. So it's not costing, you know, and then of course a 501c3 pays for the moving of the property or the building to another property. The thing is the integrity of the land that sits on is compromised that disappeared a long time ago so you know it's more about the house at this point the other implication of that is if you move the house it might possibly lose its national register standing because you just took it out from the original property it was on might not be an issue because sometimes on national register uh they, they, it deals with the building itself not the property it's sitting on but we're talking about buying anything here maybe the hospital is willing to transfer that bu- the building if it's moved off the property within 
you know, I don't know what kind of time frame. But again, now you have to have somebody that steps up, a 501c3 that actually takes ownership of the building. They transfer or move the building. It gets restored and possibly used. Uh, it could be used for any rehab reuse. It could be used as an office mm -hmm. building just to keep the building around. You know, so there's some income for the owners of the building. Um, you know, ideally it could be a, you know, education outreach building that it could be used as a um, historic home that you could be used for tours, but most likely you're going to want some sort of revenue for the building. So, I mean, I don't think the hospital is going to want to, will need to sell anything. I think, you know, I think you could convince them that there is a developmental plan for that building that, you know, you could actually have it transferred over as long as it's moved off the property. I, just I, just want to, I just want to state the obvious. I'm sure most people people just intuitively that aren't even preservation professionals or preservationists per se. Uh, moving a property is considered an absolute last resort, especially in modern preservation, just because, um, you know, a home house isn't just the box, right? It's, it's the gardens, it's the it's its setting, it's its relationships to its yeah. neighbors. It sounds like I'm not that familiar with Dover, but that this is kind of sits as a gateway to a certain neighborhood. Once you pick that up and move that, that it, it loses a ton of its integrity and its associational value, but it, it almost certainly would be removed from the National Register, as Eric points out, especially because they checked off that box landscape architecture, um, which a lot of those like higher end houses in the mid 19th and, and up through the early 20th century, um, their cachet, part of their architectural cachet was their relationship to the garden surrounding the building. And yeah. so that's all. Yeah, and those are destroyed a long time ago. So technically, yeah. you could have that building removed already if they did a review of the National Register listing. I think it wouldn't be. If I think if it was reviewed right now, it still would be considered eligible for the National Register because of its architectural loan. Right. Yeah, but if you moved it, I think it's almost it would be almost automatically delisted. Not that the, not that the National Register status is an end all be all here. That's obviously a. a uh, administrative thing. What matters is that the house is preserved and meaningful to the community, whether it's on the National Register or not. But I just wanted to point that out. A lot of times in these negotiations, a developer, or in this case, the hospital will say, well, how about we meet you in the middle by letting you guys pay to move this building, which puts all the costs on the community and <laughs> destroys the integrity of the building. That's the setting. So, uh, I, think, uh, I think if it's seen as desirable by the community to keep it where it's at, which maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, not knowing that setting and, and the, the parking lot situation there, but um, I would still try to fight the good fight and trying to find a new use for it where it sits if, if people think it should stay there. And that's the, the best case uh, scenario before resorting to the let's move it discussion. That should probably be uh, a last case scenario. Yeah, and if I can speak, yes, sorry, I my phone. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I can't silence my landline. Sorry about that. Um, I, I also want to just say that, thank you for, um, Mike, for mentioning that it would be a last resort to actually physically move the house because then it would lose its context and its placement and Hayes Hill would no longer, why even keep the name at all. So from that standpoint, it would, it, it just, I agree, but what I wanted to mention today is that the Friends of Old Dover have been the advocacy group for preservation in Dover for a long time. And uh, I think from the 70s, I just have about four houses that I want all of you to know the Friends had a direct influence on saving them. And that's McDowell Collins Storehouse, just off the green. We did that with Dover Heritage Trail. That was right around the bicentennial years. And also the John Bell House was mentioned before. We had a hand in that. And of course, we know that is um, uh, First State Heritage Park headquarters. And we all know about Rose Cottage. And uh, that was the late 70s. We directly worked with a telephone company to save the house. Um, it was transferred over to the state, which did restore it. And it's now used by um, First State Heritage Park's offices again for DENREC. So that was a real victory. Um, and also more recently in the early 2000s, we worked on the Timothy Hansen house which is the little house on right 
on Water Street, just directly across from Legislative Hall, where the Realtors Association is located. And even though that's not the original house, the original house is saved. It was dismantled piece by piece, numbered, labeled. It could be constructed right back on its spot. But what was good about the Realtors Association, who we worked with hand in hand, was that they reconstructed a very similar looking house because they felt its significance was important. And that's what we can do as the Friends of Old Dover mm -hmm. is to relay the significance of these properties. And, and Ellen, your, your PowerPoint opened my eyes. I didn't know a lot of that information. And with all the points that we've made here, I think we've got a good case to fight on, as people have said. So that's all I have. Thank you, Ann. Yep. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any comments or suggestions or questions they would like to ask us? Okay. I think Nancy Gardner had one. Um, we were only able to get into this late. Um, so I don't know all that has gone before, but when we went up two weeks ago to look at the Skull property, which we had not been on for some time, it was apparent that we had trees that needed saving, whether the house was saved or not. The, the idea of this enormous parking lot with its drainage problems, et cetera, would also potentially do away with a rare variety of magnolia, among other things, and that that property then as a giant parking lot simply comes to resemble North Governors Avenue, which is a gigantic parking lot for several lot, for several businesses, as well as the hospital. Um, in the 50 plus years we've lived in Dover, we've seen enormous changes take place in the appearance of the city, much of it for the, the better. If you don't move this property, then you actually have to hope that the hospital, instead of expanding its parking, would be willing to give up a good bit more property in order to surround the house with some kind of landscaping and visual appropriateness. This is a tricky issue because in fact, for years, the parking around the Skull House kept closer and closer and closer to the building itself so that it becomes almost an issue of demolition by neglect. Once the hospital was no longer using that building, we're, we're really late in the, the saving of this house. Um, but on site with more landscape, it might indeed be an important addition to Dover's historical scene. Um, and that means upending the hospital's desire for substantial more parking. I'm frankly very surprised that there isn't a howl um, about the issue of drainage um, for an additional parking lot of such huge size. It, and anyway, that's, 
that's my two cents, but you do have to consider um, what, what an enormity removing the building actually represents. I'd like to add just this, that I was a person who had the most to do with the uh, Victorian district going on the National Register. I find it very ironical that probably the finest remaining uh, Victorian house in Dover is going to, uh, might be replaced by a parking lot. <laughs> I would be interested in, a, in an appraisal. If that ever comes in, I'd love to be contacted about that. I think these are all good points. And I think definitely the appraisal. And I think also the whole into the narrative about what's going to replace it, you know, the massive parking lot and where does Bay Health stop? You know, I feel like with this um, last chip, that they're just going to keep expanding and there's really not going to be anything. Hmm. And yes, definitely with the appraisal and doing everything we can to raise the funds to help save it, but put as much onus on the hospital as possible to keep them at their commitment. Hey, Tom, do you want to say something? It's Tom Smith. I, I think the uh, idea that that it is a political issue and going with the, you know, making a campaign with the media, or you, uh, newspapers and so forth, is very significant. And that I think that maybe that should be revved up as quickly as possible. The idea of the go funding that that is another uh, possibility. I also think that because the parking exists there already, I wonder how much effort the hospital has spent finding alternative um, parking when that has been the easy low-lying fruit, so to speak. Um, and if, for instance, maybe this is far-fetched, but if you got the GoFunding going, and you found an alternative parking space, uh, possibly on governors or somewhere in the back of the uh, hospital, that some kind of a, a trade could be arranged where the go funding would, would fund for the hospital, the parking there, and then the, the, the hospital would give the building to the city or something, because you do, you do, the, the idea that that's the, the southern entrance to Dover, and it's, you know, it could be an attractive, beautiful building if it was not half demolished already, is um, that, that's, that's a very positive sign for the improvement in Dover. So, so I sort of think those three ideas um, might, okay. you know, might be, um, a good way to proceed. Thank you, Tom. Good point, Tom. Um, you know, we talked about the um, it becoming a visitor center. I mean, what more spectacular, beautiful oh, building could we have than that? Good idea. Right. Yes, Dan, would you like to say something? Yeah, Mary, um, it's of little import now, but landscaping has been mentioned and the crying shame Last name too. is the hospital has destroyed all that. My father told me that there were 119 different species planted by Charles Hayes and Mr. Saunders. And my goodness, wouldn't that add to the uh, to the house now? Maybe someday we can replant them. Start another garden. <laughs> You'd have to get Longwood Gardens. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're going to live to see that. 
Thank you. All right. Um, As somebody I would speak. Yes, go ahead. I was um, just thinking here that perhaps, I mean, it just seems like there's so much work to be done, but that if maybe there's a subgroup of like people to work on the GoFundMe efforts and in connection with the gentleman's interest in the appraisal, perhaps purchasing it, another group working on, which I, I kind of would like to participate on this group, maybe demonstrating and really promoting to the public what the alternative would be once that's raised, you know, and how do we get that in front of, you know, the public size. And then as well as this, uh, perhaps an area on what are the alternatives for, you know, other areas that the hospital could be pursuing in addition to keeping that past commitment of theirs always in the fold of discussion. But those are just some ideas of really, I know we're late in the game here, but um, I'm just trying to think of being late in the game. How, what are the key pieces we could really tackle to perhaps get um, it to change its course? and. I kind of like the gentleman's ideas from um, Mr. McGrath's ideas about uh, not to say shaming them, but just saying, hey, you know, it was under stewardship and look what they did, you know, that they, they, they let this go to neglect, you know, that they were supposed to maintain it and look what they're doing, that there is damage to Dover. Um, I kind of think that's an important piece to keep in it all. So those are my thoughts and I'm happy to help. Um, just, I'm very much concerned about this issue and I'm happy to help. So I'll just stop my video now. <laughs> oh, Karen, Thanks. but thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. We will get in touch with you. Um, your idea Okay. so we will. And for the rest of you uh, who have spoken, um, we, we would like to, to have further meetings on this and get together and have our, our groups together and, and try to be more proactive. So if you could, um, if you don't mind, we will, we will get in touch. If you could give us contact information. Sure thing. We could, all of you. Um, we would, we would really, we really do need the help. There's just, they're about who you've seen today, Karen and Helene and uh, uh, Nate and Anne and uh, myself and, and Donna, who has totally, Donna Josephowski, who's totally put this whole thing together for us. I don't think I've left anybody out here, um, but that's just us and we really need help, so. We I put my contact info in the um, chat. Yeah, I, did, I was going to suggest that. So if anybody <laughs> is interested that they put their contact information in the chat. And I really do like the idea of having setting up some different committees. Yes. Mm -hmm. So and we will uh, we will send out a, um, any information. We are looking forward to the meeting that we are going to have, hoping that we will get an appraisal. We'll get in the building soon. and. Um, just because we don't really have, we don't have any time to lose right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that Donna recorded this, the whole presentation, including the town hall. Donna? I did, yeah, I did. I okay. just, I, I didn't know when to cut off, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I just did, until, you know, we have notes for ourselves too, but um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So do we, did we had get everybody in attendance? Names? So yeah, we need you have everyone. Yeah, through Eventbrite. Yeah, I got the um. Well, I got the people. Okay. That mm -hmm. Good. And I also Great. want to say one one thing to Ellen. Ellen, I'm so glad you called it Little Crick. That's what we call yes. it. Yes. <laughs> it took me about ten years to to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> little Crick. 
I still don't say it, and my answers are from Little Creek, so I still say. <laughs> well, I first started <laughs> thinking it was Little Brook. It is. <laughs> is that is that restaurant still there? No, no. Oh. Oh yeah, the, Bill, what was Village it Inn or Village Inn. 